there's a lot of romanticism around being self-sufficient and you know i can manage my uh, my energy system in my in my own house and and yes that, that's that's awesome and it can also have environmental benefits but at the same time you you might the external implications on on the rest of your community the rest of your um region and people sort of sharing the electricity grid infrastructure is might not be uh, positive so it's important to think of how do we manage this dr ola olson is my guest on this episode of inside ideas brought to you by 1.5 media and innovators magazine Ola is a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute, where his work is focused on social technical transitions, primarily in the fields of energy and climate change mitigation. His research looks at the interplay between technology, business models, and public policy, and how different factors across these areas need to align to make something a viable solution. One of his key interests at the moment is trying to understand the role of different forms of scale economies and technological transition. Ola, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you. Good to be here. Good to be with you. Um, you are mainly focused in just energy or is it uh, just in general uh, energies? Well, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question because my my background is really multifaceted. I uh, started out as some sort of some sort of engineer. Um, then I have a PhD in forest resource management, which with a my dissertation was mainly based on economics. Um, and since starting at SCI, I've been I guess my my core area was looking into energy, but I've also been doing a lot of work on climate change adaptation and working with. Uh, land use issues, agriculture and forestry, um, but sort of now uh, increasingly drifting back to my sort of key fields of interest, which is uh, climate change mitigation uh, and energy issues, and, and also to a certain extent, heavy industry. So it's- um, Very big, uh, very big area, very broad uh, topic as well, but it's one yeah. that so desperately needs to be addressed. You have, uh, I don't know, recent is probably not the right word, but you started this per perspective series of kind of articles and research papers that you present on Stockholm Environment Institute website and, and uh, the, you know, an impossible tangle of things we can't understand, the bigger, the better, uh, uh, def defection and death spirals. Uh, uh, defecation and, and death spiral, sorry. <laughs> and, and basically, you know, you, you've written tons of others. So you've done articles and research papers on, on sub-Saharan Africa and on wash issues, as well as you've had some um, different type of studies cl clear dating back to 2016. You've been doing this for a while. You obviously academic, you've, you've studied these areas. You've, you've got the experience. And so you, 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 whether it's preaching to the choir or not, you've kind of been saying, okay, here's the situation, here's the research I've done. Let's put some of this in practice. We've seen some of these models work. We need to think of, of these upcoming factors. And then bam, we were hit with 12 months of the craziest time ever. Uh, pandemic, uh, COVID, um, Black Lives Matters, uh, Asian racism, the inauguration, um, lockdowns, uh, Brexit, on, on and on. I could go with all the, the world problems that we have. Um, but what I'm asking is how have you weathered all this craziness? And were any of those models, those things, the work that you did, the talks that you gave, the papers that you wrote, um, anything that helped you weather this crazy time a little bit better than usual? And, and maybe what bubbled to the surface that you say, wow, there's some amazing learning lessons uh, that I got out of this period. You know, moving into 2020, I think um, I, I had like a new year's resolution that I would travel less in 2020. So that worked out pretty well. <laughs> uh, so I think that's from that perspective, I think thinking back on, on, the, on this last year, 
from from a personal perspective, I think you know may have been net positive uh, because my life has sort of slowed down uh, in a in a positive way, uh, a lot less you know moving around the world. I had a, was doing a one hour and a half commute every day in one direction, so three hours of commuting every day. Obviously, don't do that now. So, um, just the um, realization for me that uh, behavioral change can go really quickly. Um, you know, there's there's always this tension in in um, environmentalism and environmental research around sort of are you a techno techno fix uh, or a techno optimist or you're sort of optimist in terms of how people can change. And I was certainly more on the techno optimist. I wasn't that optimistic about behavioral change before, but um, you know that if you have the right incentives and you have a pandemic you know but obviously you can see behavioral change going really quickly as well so i think it's it's really impressive to show uh, or impressive to see how these all these digital tools that were you know the the basic infrastructure and everything was there two years ago as well but they, you know still people were still flying around the world you know i had a i think a very clear example I think in April last year, I was supposed to go to Sao Paulo for like a six day meeting. <laughs> and then it turns out we could we could uh, do that meeting in like two times two hours of Zoom meetings. <laughs> so in terms of my point of view, not having to do that uh, trip, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I would love to go to Sao Paulo, but for me, the whole logistics of, of um, getting away from my family, you know, I was getting pretty sick of that. So. Uh, to me, that was like a pretty good, uh, pretty, pretty good way of new, uh, new way of doing things. And so, are you telling me you you feel that there there is a better operating system, a better model for some of the inefficiencies of how we've done work in the past? And and um, were, were there any specific applications of things that you've taught or spoke about? Because you're talk you talk a lot about off grid energy. You talk a lot about these different perspectives on how how we see some of our world's problems. Obviously, you're living in Sweden, so you've probably got it pretty darn good on infrastructure and things there. But uh, are, are there some some applications that can help um, even those in Sweden weather a pandemic or crazy times like this a lot better and emerge different? I mean, for I'll just give an example. For me, I been speaking about climate environment and food uh, for for many decades and um, uh, my phone was off the hook my emails were blowing up people were like we didn't listen to you all these years help us we we need to speak to you we need some help what can we do um, we need to change our system we need to do we need to find a better system that works through it uh, gives us a little resilience and works through other times did you see anything that's similar to that I think resilience is a really, really key word here. We did um, some research a couple of years back looking into uh, how Swedish um, export companies dealt with, with their supply chains and how exposed they were to disruptions, basically. So we, we obviously focused on um, if you have uh, climate change increasing um, risks and, and, um, uh, and severity of extreme weather events. You know? So how does that how exposed are Swedish export industries to that and how to what extent are they thinking about that and you know the when you, you we did a couple of I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 interviews and and most most of them aren't sort of at that time at that time this was five years back so weren't thinking that much about this to be honest um, even though they had experienced uh, these kinds of disturbances before you know with the Fukushima had a really important uh, a really strong implication a lot of global supply chains there was a really large um, flood in bangkok uh, 10 or 15 years back that sort of took out um, a large chunk of the world's production of hard drives which had also a lot of spillover all over the world but even though you know they, they didn't really have that much of like risk management systems and expo and uh, maybe not as good good um, understanding of how complicated their supply chains were uh, so I think that's something that's come up on the agenda a lot in, in the last last year, if nothing else. And I think there's a there's a, a lot of you know, the the thought process around how you how do you structure an economy, a global, global economy that's as complex as this. Um, I think that's that whole thought process has been accelerated in in, in the last year to a 
to a really significant extent. I think that's super um, valuable. We could dive into a lot more deeper subjects when uh, of, of some of the things that you've you've brought up just in that uh, kind of weathering the pandemic and what you've seen of these supply chains and things around the world, specifically um, what's for me, I live in Hamburg, Germany, uh, I'm from the United States, but I've seen a lot of bubbling up where there's been ex some extreme reliance on, on Asia and uh, the products that Asia does that were no longer flowing quite as they used to, um, but also uh, that, you know, with even with Brexit around food, there is now the lockdowns and no migrant workers to harvest food and, and, and other major issues that we've seen around the world, that there are some pretty big holes in, in not just our supply chain, but in overall our operating system, our, our global operations worldwide. And I, I think it's brought, brought a, a lot to light and bubble to the surface that we've been able to see. Um, you come from a country of Nobel laureates, uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, um, uh, obviously the, the um, uh, Stockholm Environmental Institute is just up there and wonderful. And I, I really uh, deal with you guys on other programs with MIT and, and other of your colleagues and, and the standard of what you guys do around the world for sustainability and awareness is par none. There is this big question um, that uh, we've really been faced with in lockdown and during during the pandemic, and that is this view of globalization or global citizenry. You know, a world without borders, nations, division, humanity, one from another, but also the way we look at our supply chains, the globalization of it all, and whether we've already had it for decades or, or if it's something that we need to really improve and look at it, uh, from different angles. What are your thoughts or feelings, not just as a researcher from SEI, but also just in general on your, your views and, and travelings around the world and your research about global citizenry, about globalization and, and the divisions and nations, humanity of one from another? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about globalization because um, the, the, it's sort of a natural conclusion of, of uh, a market economy that you, you, you tie things together and you have more and more uh, participants and, and actors as the global economy grows and you can have a specialization in, in specific regions and so on. And you know, there's benefits to that in terms of efficiencies and cost reductions and stuff like that. But there's also, um, you know, the, the more efficient efficiency in a, a supply chain or a, an economic system often tends to be uh, connected with a sort of, a, you know, you want to do, reduce slack, right? So you, you make a system more efficient by reducing slack. But that slack can be uh, pretty valuable. Uh, <laughs> for example, if there's a pandemic or, and you see that in, in how you've organized, there's an interesting discussion in Sweden as well around healthcare. So you, you have a healthcare system that's very, very efficient and it works, works very good if nothing happens that's out of the ordinary. But of course, in healthcare, everything, you know, there, things happen out of the ordinary all, all the time. So, don't, so then the system is, is not that, that, uh, that resilient to, to unexpected changes. And so I think that's, something that really needs to be considered when you think of it, the global economy as well, that yeah, well, there are efficiencies and there are cost benefits to have, but, but also how do we, can, can we sort of have that cake and eat the sort of resilient cake at the same time? Um, and I'm thinking of that as a, as, you know, as a person as well, obviously you're, you're part of a lot of different contexts. You know, I guess my, my family is this sort of the one that I'm most, uh, centered in but then of course in, in sort of expanding circles and, and the global economy and the you know the rest of the seven billion or whatever we are are obviously also I'm part of that clique be it uh, quite a large clique as well. Uh, absolutely and, and you you bring up a couple topics that come up um, quite a bit and with that globalization and that is systems systems thinking and resilience. 
and those two, I, I don't think they can be separated from, from each other because I, I think without systems or dynamic uh, systems dynamics, you really can't have that re resilience. You're only focusing in on one or two silos or, or certain facets of, of a complex system. And, and then that, that deters you from having true resilience. And as um, Carl Sagan said at once, uh, um, a couple of times actually, that uh, there's this new consciousness arising that sees the world as a single organism and an organism divided amongst itself or in conflict or fighting amongst itself is doomed. And, and that even though we're, you know, we, we hear that the Amazon is the, the lungs of our planet and, and <laughs> which can be misconstrued because it's that, that oxygen that's really created there remains there, it doesn't get all over. But in some specs, there's so much that ties to the bigger ecosystem and biodiversity of our planet that, that ties that, that systems together. In um, 2018, all international organizations um, switch from this linear siloed approach to solving human suffering and our global grand challenges to really this strong push towards systems dynamic thinking, systems view of life thinking, these complexity, embracing complexity and systems modeling. Um, how has you as SEI, your organization, seen this switch or transition occur? Um, I personally, in, in the United Nations, I saw all sorts of dynamic models, systems models pop up, not just with the SDGs, with other uh, like fishing industries, farming industries, where they put them into a dynamic model. And then the World Economic Forum came up with um, transformational maps on their website, uh, um, which are basically systems modeling of how everything ties together. How has you as SEI and how have you seen that in Sweden that that's been embraced or pushed forward as well, the systems way of thinking of the world? Yeah, well, to me, that that's just sort of, it feels like, oh, finally, everyone's getting it, <laughs> right? Because uh, I've, been, I've been a systems person all my life, basically. I've been sort of everything. I've been sort of coming to a point if I find a topic and I sort of, I dig a little bit into it, but then I get to a point where it's, ah. Oh, now it's now I'm digging too deep, and then I try. Oh, the interesting now is how does this connect to this and this and this, and then I'll jump to something else and try to dig into that, and and find at a certain point to sort of have a sort of decent view of how everything fits together. Not everything, obviously, but more and more fit, things fit together. And I think these are the you're not going to be able to solve any grand challenges with how, having this perspective. At the same time, you're not going to be able to solve all challenges in the same way, or you, you can't optimize on having everything um, as, as in its sort of highest possible uh, uh, properties in terms of quality of life or, or climate change mitigation or anything, because there's always gonna be this kind of conflicts. And I had a, an interesting discussion earlier this morning about um, uh, forestry and and I think how, and climate, so, and because, that's one sector where there might, this, there's this, I think inherently an assumption that what's good for the climate is good for biodiversity, is good for water and so on. But that's not really, if you, if you try, if you really want to understand, that's not really always, they don't always go in sync. So something that's very important for, for climate might not be that uh, beneficial for biodiversity. I uh, know there's, there are like, uh, some emerging conflicts, for example, in, in California right now, where they are one of the site these really large solar parks in the in the desert, you know, which is obviously going to be very beneficial for in terms of increasing the um, proportion of renewable energy on the grid. But at the same time, you know, there are this uh, desert where desert tortoises uh, there. There's there are really an endangered species, and 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 you have these uh, sensitive uh, regions in terms of biodiversity, and those are not going to like being covered by by uh, you know, a couple of hectares of solar panels. So you, you're gonna have these kinds of conflicts. And I think it's important to realize that it's not gonna be smooth sailing all the time. So you're gonna have to manage these sort of trade-offs in a lot of different contexts um, and just sort of be aware of that. And that's just two of them. And if, if you just look across the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, you're gonna have to <laughs> combine all those, you know, gonna have a lot of 
um, instances where where you see right well this is a this is a real conflict here you know we can't have both of these um, at the same time or at least we have to rethink a lot of our systems to to get to that point i like how how you put that in, into perspective it's really almost a balancing act. So I like to talk a lot about uh, quantum computing. And, you know, when they try to describe quantum computing, they're like saying it's both on and off at the same time, zeros and ones at the same time, you know, both states. And, and, and a lot of the things that we do for environment and ecology, um, trying to solve these global grand challenges, there's always two sides of the coin. And, and you know, there's one way to use the exponential function in horrific ways. And there's an, another way that's how you solve it is by using it in a very positive way with the right solutions and innovations. And uh, this really brings me so nicely to your series on perspectives because you, uh, a lot of it has to do with like these electrification and in uh, one of your papers, you really kind of give us this example and I've been to many events and you have as well. And that's how you wrote about it where people will show you the uh, uh, image or satellite image of the earth that they've done and show you the lights at night, you know, on the map type of a thing and say, okay, well, this is the electrification or this is the lights that we have around the world and the major cities and so on. And um, it, it can really sometimes be a misleading picture on, on how infrastructure, electrification, and things are, and, and maybe not give us the right image. And so I, I would like uh, you to more specifically tell us how, how we should look at, look at that and go into your article a little bit about how we drill down and get the facts of it. And then I, and then I wanna go into some of your solutions and your ideas of, of what's emerging. And I, I've seen this as well as I work with a, FAO and World Food Program and the refugee crisis and how they just do camps, you know, get basic needs to camps as well as rural areas in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, whatever. So I'd appreciate that. Yeah, so um, when we talk about the, the sustainable development goals, um, I, as I said, I'm the, I have like, I'm, I consider myself an energy person if, if I'm gonna classify myself as something. So I really think the one that's um, SDG number seven is called sustainable energy for all. I think that's, to me, it's like solve that one and, and everything else is, is gonna be a lot easier. Um, and also from a pure, you're saying quantum, quantum computing, if you think from, from a purely physical perspective, from a pure physics perspective, you know, nothing, you know, energy is, is in everything. So um, I think, and, and what's been emerging over the last five years probably is this idea that if you want to resolve uh, climate change issues uh, and you know uh, a lot of the other problems around energy, you know, be it pollution and, and whatnot, the sort of the slogan "electrify everything" has been has been really really taking on. And, yeah, no, no, and as always, you should qualify things, but I think electrify most most things. <laughs> I think that's a good way of of getting to getting to uh, uh, a better better world in terms of energy. So how do we do that then? And I think here's what's been really, well, first of all, one reason why we had this electrify everything idea is that you have seen these sort of super rapid cost reductions in, in solar and in wind and in, uh, in batteries uh, over the last 10 years. You know, obviously those technologies were available 25 years or 30 years as well, but you, you, know, you didn't really get to the scale where you could sort of have these proper cost reductions until fairly recently. So this, it's become more and more clear that, you know, these are some really, this really good stuff happening here. And we can sort of, if we want to get to a sort of a, um, you know, have a, have a chance of, of meeting our climate change mitigation emissions, you know, this, building on this uh, positive trend now is probably going to be the way to do it. Um, and what's, I've, what I've found interesting is that we started looking at this, I guess, four or five years ago, well, I started looking at you know, plenty of people that looked at it before me, but uh, trying to understand, okay, so, well, we see these kinds of cost reductions in, in some of these energy technologies, but we also see a lot of 
uh, energy technologies where you don't see any cost reductions at all. So if you look at hydropower, you know, people say, well, renewable energy has gotten a lot cheaper in the last 10 years. Well, that's not really true. If you look at hydro, that hasn't gone, gotten any cheaper in the last 10 years. If you look at biomass-based power, that hasn't gotten any cheaper. So there seems to be some specific kinds of technologies that have become cheaper. So then we start trying to think about what, okay, what's the, what's, what are their characteristics? And one characteristic that we sort of, what, what I've sort of thought about them is, is that, you know, you don't deploy these in really large individual chunks. You build lots of them and you sort of deploy them in large numbers. And I thought, well, that's, that's, that's interesting because that's, uh, that's not, uh, that it's not just, it's not renewable versus fossil. It's, it's just, it seems to be a completely different way of, of setting things up. Um, and, uh, that's what we've been sort of doing a lot of digging in, in the last couple of years, just trying to understand, okay, what does this mean? And what, what, um, what happens, how do you set up a system that has these kinds of properties where you deploy in large numbers rather than building a sort of large individual uh, um, units? Um, and, and how does that, when you try to integrate these two systems, uh, where one is based on you know, the existing system in terms of electricity is based on you have large production units, be it a nuclear power station, be it a coal power station, uh, under, uh, and then you have like power lines going, going all over the world or, or uh, at least within countries. But uh, if you have a system where you sort of solar, for example, a solar panel, you know, if you, if, I think an interesting example is if you're going to build, um, say, a one gigawatt power station. That's a, really, that's a big power station. Uh, and if you use nuclear technology, you maybe have one or two reactors. You can even, it can be one reactor. But if you're, you're going to build a one gigawatt uh, solar power station from solar, then you'll pay, put in you know, a couple of hundred thousand individual panels. You don't, it's, you know, so, and, and then we started thinking, so why would you not put in, if you're going to build a nuclear power station, why don't you build one? Why is it just one uh, reactor? Why isn't it 400,000 small reactors? Or if you're going to build a power station, why did you make it one big boiler, one big chimney? Why didn't you build it 400,000 small? <laughs> so what's it? So try to understand that dynamic and what are the, if we, there seems to be a fairly different logic between, you know, solar on the one hand, uh, and then this other sort of traditional energy technology on the other, other hand. And if you think about how electricity systems are based around one kind of technology that you build in concentrated large units, and then you, you know, you uh, have wires going all over compared to one where you sort of, there doesn't seem that much to be that much value in putting a lot of sort of um, production at the same point. Um, so what we've been trying to understand now is that, so basically there are clear benefits in terms of you know, again, seeing electrification and energy as, as a key enabler of sustainable development, you know, there, this opens up a lot of possibilities for, for countries and, and regions that aren't electrified yet. Because obviously you don't need to wait until someone builds a large power station in the middle of a country and sort of uh, you build the transmission cables and uh, the whole distribution network. And, that, you know, that takes forever. And it's super complicated. It's super complicated in a well-functioning Democracy with the you know solid institutions, it's like you know, we have a lot of troubles building power power lines in Sweden. But you know, imagine doing it in a country that has you know, fragile institutions, maybe no no uh, uh, poorly functioning legal system. It's going to be super complicated. It might not happen in uh, you know in, in a lifetime. So having this alternative way of setting up electricity system, it can be. I think it can be hugely beneficial in terms of of, of development and, and all the sort of spillovers that you can get from that. In, in your research, did you see uh, <clears throat> there's over the past few years, there's been just enormous uh, data and information coming out. How many solar panels are going up every minute in India and Bangladesh and on and on around the world? Um, and in a lot of cases, those are just these you know, like uh, one single small solar panel up on a hut. Um, that's how they're getting the numbers up. It's not the kind of sol solar panels that we see from the, the Western world where we're thinking, you know, this, this big rooftop uh, panel, it's usually something else. Um, in, your, in your data, are you seeing that that is really overtaking uh, uh, 
these large scale operations where the smaller microgrid, off grid uh, solar panels are much more in coming, as well as other renewable uh, off grid type of technologies for for developing countries, for refugee camps, for places struggling. Yeah, well, the, I think the first thing to realize is that the, the panels themselves aren't that different, you know, so you probably have the same kind of basic design, even if you, if you have one individual panel or if you put 50 of them on the roof, like I have in my home, or if you put five, four million uh, in, a, in a huge park in the desert somewhere. And I think that's part of the, the, the success, you know, so you have one standardized design uh, that's modular and you, you can just, you know, chunk them out in, in huge numbers. Uh, which gives you super understandardized. So it's it's super easy in terms of design and just sort of increase the numbers. So I think that's an imp important aspect to be aware of. But but in terms of how they are deployed, you know, there's th that's another interesting question actually. So when you talk about electrification and um, that's that's not a sort of a, a binary measure. So. You know, there are plenty of places in the world where you do have electricity at certain points of the day, but then you know we have you have regular blackouts or you have brownouts, and you have uh, you might have uh, you know if, if at certain points of at times of uh, in the evening you know the, the light goes out and then will be a uh, one and a half minute of darkness and then someone turns on some, turn, turns on a diesel generator and the light comes back on. So you know that's obviously a, a poor a poor quality of electricity. Uh, access so and the same goes for if you look at what what solar can do in in terms of providing electricity there's also what's been very widespread in in, in the last decade probably is these kinds of solar home systems where you have a, a solar panel and then you have a, associated that you might have a a couple of uh, lanterns maybe and a phone charger something like that so that's that's incredibly beneficial it, it takes away a lot of the need to burn uh, kerosene or or uh, other fuels that, that might burn pretty dirty um turn takes away the need to do that but uh the, that's just sort of the first step if you want to take it to the next level and if you have one have want to have something like a refrigerator or even if you want to go to electric cooking for example that requires sort of a it's a quite big step change in terms of the demand for for the, the power that you need and it, and it's that it's sort of it, it goes to show that you can get pretty far in terms of providing the basic services from from uh, from a solar based system just just to have the lighting and the, and the phone charging but if you want to have if you, if you want to get a, a fully all the kinds of energy services that we have uh, in in the sort of industrialized uh, and, and sort of the rich rich part of the world, it's it's not going to be easy, but it's still super interesting and super important to understand how the route to get to you know a proper level of, of decent electrification. How do we do that? Building on this model where you sort of might add one solar panel first, and then you get a little bit of electricity, and then you and you can build it again modularly from that. And it's something that that we have to sort of rethink how electricity systems are set up because the, the, the inherent logic is, is quite different. But, but uh, at, at the same time, it's also forces to be aware of some of the, some of the, you know, the, the vast differences in terms of, you know, energy is such a, such a, an enabler of, of, you know, development and, and activity, economic activity and so on. And, and the sort of the, the vast differences in terms of energy access. I think one really clear example that I saw, we were looking at a case, and I think they were setting up a mini grid in some, in some pretty small village in, in Tanzania. I think, and I think they were the mini grid total output of the mini grid was six kilowatts, and I think there were, I don't know, maybe a thousand people living in the village, and six kilowatts, and I have fifteen kilowatts on my roof. No, so crazy. <laughs> fifteen kilowatts on my roof for people living here and you know and that's for then six kilowatts for mini grid was supposed to cover the whole so there's a you know there's so much left to do there i i have a lot of friends who uh, do different expeditions around the world uh one of them's a himalayan expedition where they actually lug solar panels up to up the mountains to different villages to get them um some form of electricity and lighting 
um, so that they can work and function better, study, learn, do all sorts of things differently. Um, one of the points that you mentioned in, in your, your different papers and part of this uh, whole series that you do on perspectives is really that this Western world, this weird society of developed countries who have the grids, who have the infrastructure, who most of them have put a lot of the cabling and infrastructure underground. So there's still some that are above grounds, but that is a much different view than um, in other parts of the world and even in developing parts. Just for example, I live in Germany. Germany has a law um, that you know any kind of renewable energy, whether it's wind or solar, has to be connected to the grid. It can't be. Uh, you always have to be connected to the grid. If you produce more than you use, that it goes back to the grid. That it's that it's all kind of controlled and regulated. And and other countries don't have that. You you could have a a cabin or a garden house or, or whatever else and that requirement probably different in certain parts of the world and in and um, in developing countries whether we're talking um, like Tanzania and Africa different places in Africa India certain places in Asia um, that really the the fact is they don't even have the infrastructure there is no grid there's not even the microgrid in, in some cases there and uh, it's usually these entangled wires like crazy bangkok the the wire spaghetti if if they have something is um, uh, you'd you'd have to be an italian electrical chef to understand their uh, their electrification and uh, electrification of their grid is just crazy but that um there are so many emerging technologies, so many new organizations coming out with actually even old um, technologies of solar panels, wind energies, these, uh, these pup uh, wind things for, for roofs that are just popping up all over for small micro grids, small micro solutions for, for different areas. There's a company out, out of Germany it's called um, SolarCon it stands for solar container. They provide uh, s uh, solar panels inside a container that's like a total off the grid. Uh, I, th I think it's more than 30,000 kilowatt hours a year that it can provide, which if in the U.S. I think it's something like four to five families or maybe you know even less than the U.S. uses a little bit more than the global average. Um, but there, there are some solutions. And the biggest one that I've seen to date is IKEA. IKEA in India and their Asian operations are really started selling solar panels like crazy, enabling those do-it-yourselfers to take those home to whatever situation, uh, their home, their garden, to start to get lighting and change that and take control of those basic needs or put the control of basic needs back into there because there aren't any matching infrastructural grids policies in place for people, what do you do now? Okay, is that allowed? Is it not allowed? How do they connect to the grid? And uh, people are getting very creative to use those in different ways. And, and in, your, in your perspective, uh, this impossible tangle of things that we can't understand and, and that there's it goes a little bit deeper in, into some of those off the grid uh, areas as well that I that I really liked and I thought that are important for us to kind of get into another mode of thinking. How do we, because it's a different form of systems thinking, it's a different form of resilience, which we touched upon in the beginning. How do we get into that mode, no matter where we live, that we start to think, hey, the only one responsible for my basic needs and I meet my basic needs is me. And uh, that we start need to start thinking, how can we ensure that no matter what time or whenever that in the future, we're not just have those basic needs met, but that we're thinking um, sustainably, resiliently, that it'll be there, not damage human health and our planet. Can you go into any more about what your topic says about those solutions? Yeah. No, I think that's, uh, I think you raised some really interesting questions there. And uh, so it's, um, there are positives and, and negatives here. So what, what it does, yes, it does allow you to, for example, put 
solar on your rooftop if you have a house and you and you have the financial means. Um, meaning you can, you know, you need to buy less and less power from the grid. Um, at the same time, um, that in itself sort of might strengthen already existing inequity aspects. So again, I think I think if I, I'll bring out California again because I think it's a very interesting. For, for for lots of different reasons, but the situation there that you have with with the wildfires um, in the last couple of years and how they've been really strongly connected to to the power transmission grid, and which has been sort of responsible for a lot of the the fires. Uh, so they what they were doing now is that you know first of all you can get power outages from the fires themselves, but also the, they've started sort of doing this what they call the public safety shutoffs, where you basically uh, in advance turn off the they shut down the power so that the power doesn't cause a wildfire if it's really yeah, yeah. rolling they have rolling blackouts but they also have these shutdowns because of uh, fires exactly so a lot of people are and, and of course california is a really sunny place so with a uh, large solar system and a you know if you add some battery storage to that it's it's feasible it's not it's not going to be cheap but it's feasible to be completely off grid uh, and a lot of people are really starting to to investigate that route more seriously and that's something that's clearly viable if you have the financial means as i said you know so but if you and so you can sort of and next time there's a public safety shut off then well then you know i've got my solar and i got my battery and i you know i'm, I'm doing fine whereas your neighbor down the street who might not you know be as well off or might not have uh, sort of the the economic possibilities to have that it's, it's not going to it's going to have a sh uh, power power outage so that in itself sort of creates a new kind of inequity that we haven't really seen to the same extent in electricity markets before because or in electricity systems because it's you know it tends to be like if the power goes out and or you know it goes out for everyone you know it's very you know some people obviously have like these diesel generators in your backyard but that's not that's you know you don't want to avoid that but so what happens then if the this and this leads to it can lead to something that we that's called um, the utility death spiral. So if you have poor quality on the grid and some people who have the financial means choose to go completely off grid, and then you have one less customer paying um, uh, paying the sort of upkeep of the electricity grid, which means you have less money um, going into the grid. So you might need to raise your tariffs meaning that it makes even more sense for the next person to go off the grid and then then that person goes off the grid and you have to increase your tariffs again leading to another 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 this um, sort of death spiral for the utilities so, and in you know whether it's going to happen um i think there's a risk uh, in some pla places where you have really good solar resources and uh, a grid that's that's really struggling like in california but um Along this route, you have also this risk of creating these inequities where, where you see that, well, some people have this sort of financial means to go off grid and some people don't. And who, what's going to happen to those? And, and how do we resolve this? So in that way, I think it's important to see that, yes, there are important opportunities being created by this new technology becoming cheaper and cheaper. And you know, at the same time as this, this the cost of these upkeep of the power transmission um, and distribution system, that sort of goes up and maybe jumps a little bit as you have to invest in, in, in um, and wildfire protection, or whatever. At the same time, you see the cost of solar just continuing down, cost of batteries continuing down. So at some point, when these meet, it, you know, there's going to be clear tensions arising in terms of how you manage our our electricity systems, uh, especially in these kinds of locations where you have the the right geographical conditions. What What are your thoughts on on the the problems that you see could be arising, and what what are you trying to tell us by that? Are Are you telling us there's going to be a shift, there's got to be a change, or what are we not prepared for? What What's kind of the message? I don't know. It's it's super complicated. I, th I think it's just important to start thinking about this um, because there's a lot of romanticism around being self-sufficient and, you know, I can manage my uh, my energy system in my in my own house. And, and yes, that, that's, that's awesome. And it can also have environmental benefits. But at the same time, you're, you might, the external, implications on on the rest of your community rest of your um 
region and people sort of sharing the electricity grid the infrastructure is might not be uh, positive so it's important to think of how do we manage this because i'm certain that it, you can you can manage it in a way that's that's that it's comes out beneficial for everyone but you have to think this through and it's it's not that these and especially you know you've seen the where we are now in terms of costs of of uh, solar and, and batteries but that's not going to stop you know these they're going to continue to get uh, um, less expensive, whereas the, the, it's highly likely, in my point, in my view, point as well, at least that that the sort of the, the whole the whole large grid-based system is going to sort of have a slightly uh, upward-trending cost curve. So these tensions will will arise in more and more locations uh, as as we go along. I, I absolutely agree with you. A lot of people didn't really understand, especially the reporters who were reporting um, Elon Musk battery day kind of announcement. They thought, okay, we're, we're waiting for this new battery. And really, um, and there, there wasn't a new battery. What he says is we're improving the way the gigafactory works and it's not no longer a gigafactory is going to be a terafactory. So we've increased the amount of batteries and our efficiency, how we produce. And so instead of just producing a, a gig, uh, a gigawatt of, of energy of, of, of batteries, we can do a terawatt. And, uh, and that is a true game changer. And that's why I absolutely know that curve is is going to come sooner than later. There was another pinnacle book that came out um, I believe it was the end of last year the, uh, or during the pandemic from Mark Z. Jacobson. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's the big energy guru in the United States. I believe it's a Stanford uh, University, but he's spoken everywhere. He's kind of, I, I think he's on one of the energy boards um, for the government as well. And, and then there's another one, it's called Revolutionary Power from Shalanda Baker. She just became the department of uh, deputy director of the Department of Energy for um, the for the United States under uh, Biden Harris administration, and she was actually on the podcast and she's talking about a lot of the inequities, even from renewable energy, how some of the inequities on indigenous people on people locally how. Um, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing, but there's a lot of encroachments and a lot of issues that can arise out of that. And that we're, I think globally, <laughs> and the, we're suffering a very high niveau here in the, in the developed world for sure, but in the, in the developing countries, they really have the crappiest politics, the crappiest infrastructures. They're just not prepared. They're, you know, we're talking about how, how do we get them renewable energy and electrification? How do we get them to another form of development? And uh, there, there's all sorts of factors and issues that come in that are just hampering them to make that switch or hampering them to help them on this transition. I, I see, and this is what I read out and I'd like to find out from you, what, what, and obviously you don't have all the answers, but kind of what your thoughts and feelings are, I believe this transition to self-empowerment of kind of an off-grid mentality, because th there is a cost for kerosene. There is a cost for using fossil fuels, e even in a bad infrastructure in a developed world. And uh, if they, they start to make this realization as the rest of the world does that some of these off-grid solutions that are renewable whether it's uh, ambient water harvesting or solar water harvesting or uh, solar energy, or even these wind donkeys that are, you know, pretty small scale that are generating a substantial amount of energy that are really popping up in different areas to, to apply those, the long, even the short and long-term benefit of, of that transition um, may be an initial hit slightly, but it's actually a better better model long-term with a lot more resilience for them uh, um, to, to kind of be a people shift in how infrastructures work because those infrastructures aren't, uh, get, tell me if I'm wrong, that's in the past, we've been looking for our governments, our institutions to deliver those infrastructures 
And a lot of places are disappointed. They're just not coming. They're not up to speed with our exponentially growing world. And so I see that shift of places like Ikea offering solar panels. Just They've just put into their mix these, um, on a small scale, these in-home vertical farms that you can do some um, sprouting and farming. But now they've done it to an even bigger scale so that small communities can grow food off the grid with renewable energy on their own, you know? So they're taking care of the basic needs, you know? Yeah, well, I think I think it's a matter of um, us not fully realizing um, how, you know, so I think that the International Energy Agency said a couple of, maybe probably last year, that sort of solar is the new king of, of energy markets. And if we sort of, I assume that that's going to be continuing in the future. So we're going to have a, a global electricity system that's increasingly dominated by solar. And I think that that's, um, we're certainly going towards that in, in a large extent. Then we also have to rethink how the logic of solar as a dominant electricity generation resource, how, how that logic can sort of spill over into other kinds of technologies and other kinds of how we set up our economies and set up our supply chains because it doesn't make as much it might not make as much sense to concentrate stuff in one location and then transport it uh, all over the world as i read some interesting research a couple of weeks ago on, on fertilizer production for example so fertilizer is now produced or well, nitrogen fertilizer is produced via natural gas and you have this large uh, you know, petrochemical facilities where you produce natural gas but you can also produce what you need for natural gas or for fertilizer production is hydrogen. And of course you can produce, produce hydrogen from uh, just uh, electricity and water. So if you can do that uh, and you have the, but you haven't been doing that because the electricity has been, it's been too expensive to do it that way. But if you have decentralized, um, if you have a, an electricity resource that lends its ni itself, nice, itself nicely to decentralization and distribution, distributed generation like solar does, uh, and interestingly, uh, electrolyzer, which is what you use to produce uh, the equipment that sort of splits water into hydrogen and oxygen, those seem also to be be uh, have that same characteristic that they are, you know, they could make a lot of sense to have them distributed. So that means that you in in um, in the future you could have a, a setup where you don't do um, fertilizer production in centralized uh, facilities, like, and then you shift it around. Well, then you could have. Uh, decentralized uh, uh, production of of, um, uh, of fertilizer, and I thought uh, the the paper I was reading was about uh, the U.S. and I would say, well, uh, now most of it is produced close to these like you know large petrochemical regions, um, whereas uh, it would make more, and then shipped to the to the to the Midwest where they have the a large the, the crop grown regions. So it would make more sense to maybe then uh, make use of the excellent wind resources that you might have in, in Iowa or in, in uh, those parts of the country and combine that with uh, and just produce the uh, fertilizer closer to where it's going to be used. And that might be a, a more cost efficient systems in the end. So, that, and that's something that's sort of, oh, wow, that, that sort of shifts, you know, turns all the logic thinking about supply chains and how those are set up on its head, basically. And I think these are the kinds of things we will need to consider even more if we're going to sort of base our you know, first of all, our electricity system. But again, I was, as I was saying before, if we're going to electrify everything, then then that means that whatever's happening in the electricity system is going to have a larger and larger uh, influence on the on the global economy and and, and industries and, and production systems and so on. So I think that there's something here that we need to start thinking more seriously about how this affects the the way the economy is set up in terms of, of supply chains and. and I, I totally understand. There's this. Uh there's a ripple effect and I mean we've talked about it before and and at the at the climate conferences and in different circles whether it's Stockholm Resilience Institute or, or SEI um, that there's you know the rising billions who have smartphones in their in their hands and uh, have access to you know now with Starlink broadband from from Elon and other emerging global networks that they're going to have a broadband internet in their hands and access to all sorts of these things. There was at um, the two, two, uh, 2018, I believe it was, it was the COP26 
24 in Katowice, Poland, um, I hosted uh, Guideco in the GEI, Global Energy Interconnectedness. It's an Asian-based project, but it uh, Guideco stands for the Global Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization. And it's basically the renewable energy grid for the world. And it's uh, decentralized. It's not owned by anybody. It's for everyone. It's basically when we have that renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind, it's this big, huge issue of how do we distribute it? How do we phase it down? How do we get it into the right grid to distribute it around? And and even here in Germany, I mean, we we really kind of started the movement of solar or of wind power and uh, really pushed wind power and renewable energy forward uh, in many ways. But then we didn't have a grid to distribute it, <laughs> and it fell flat on its face. And it's starting to recover a bit, but we're still way way behind. But the rest of the world's looking even worse that we don't have a grid to distribute it all evenly and, and get it to everybody where it's needed, which is a form of a global, uh, it's not only a global energy interconnection, which is bringing everybody on board, just like the Paris Agreement or whatever other agreements, whether it's a, uh, a trade agreement or a cooperation agreement to make sure that that's an inalienable universal right for any everyone but uh, that they distribute that. And if uh, I believe that's the only big one that I know about, but I, I believe that there's a couple smaller projects from um, Enel Energy and from uh, Vattenfall and a couple others that are moving forward on some pretty big projects, which, which will electrify or provide grids uh, for, for a lot of people around the world. And, the moment that occurs, there's this switch, there's this change, there's this emergent uh, shift in humanity to to uh, see the world, act upon the world in a much different way than usual. And uh, that leads me to a few questions on, on in your research and your, your thinking. Humanity has really had this thing, and I call it the human condition, where we have problems cooperating with each other, where we're all uh, distant cousins, homo sapiens, and we're all on this uh, spaceship Earth. Um, but even in the United Nations or the World Economic Forum, it's like this person shouting their message here and this person shouting their message. And they're both great messages, but they're not collaborating and working together. And they're kind of this human condition as I'll, I'll do it myself and do it my own way. and. In some respects, I see that as something that you kind of mentioned with us off grid and, and you know, let's let's just take care of our our own uh, basic needs of electrification of so, uh, renewable energy, solar panels, wind donkeys or whatever. Um, but do you think that humanity will ever kind of overcome this human condition and come together and, you know, quit fighting North and South Korea with China's putting the blame on someone else that will figure out that we're all on this, uh, uh, all, all not passengers, but all crew members on this spaceship Earth? Yeah. I tend to think that, um, you know, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be too optimistic about the future, but you shouldn't be too pessimistic either. Um, I'm, I'm, I have like, the, I'm, I really struggle when people sort of say, well, uh, you know, the world is such an awful place right now. And it's going to, oh, you know, what, at which point in time was it a good place? You know, how is today, you know, can you say that today is better or worse than 10 or 15 years ago? And you can choose any year in history and say well is 2021 worse or better than this one and I'm, i think you're going to struggle to come up with a good solution because everything's been good or bad in different ways throughout um, history so i think we i think in, the key thing is to find a, a setup where sort of all the human idiosyncrasies and how the you know our quirks and and how we bicker about things don't have really large uh, you know planet destroying implications you know i was just about uh, probably three years at the time but i don't remember but you know the world could very well have ended pretty much in 1982 when, when there was this uh, 
a Soviet colonel who, who didn't press the button to sort of launch a full response in terms of a nuclear attack because there was a, a signal coming in that the US had launched their entire missile fleet coming into the to the you know, over over Soviet territory, but it turns out it was just a sort of technical fluke. But if he had followed his instructions and pressed that button like he should have, then you know it would be a pretty different world right now. So, would you say that 1982 was a better year to be alive than 2021? Well, you know that that getting that close to sort of global annihilation, I don't think so. So pretty good if we if we sort of can again it goes back to the thing we talked about resilience if you have a system that is not as you know sensitive to disturbances so if, if you can take disturbances and you don't have things i think i'm not sure what, but in logistics they talk about like hot systems with a, that are really sort of sensitive to disturbances and i think that's something you really want to avoid and one thing where i would see so you know opportunities in, in sort of phasing out fossil fuels is that you don't you will hopefully not be, well, you won't be as reliant on these continuous flows of energy, which we are now so hugely reliant on these pipelines flowing, uh, gas or oil that can be used as, as weapons or turn it off or turn it on. Um, uh, you know, sh ships getting stuck in the Suez Canal, uh, turn it off and turn it had hu huge implications. So, so sort of just, if you get to a point where, and people say, well, uh, lithium is the new oil or, or uh, batteries is the new oil. That's not the case. If you, you know, if you if you have a embargo on batteries or an embargo on solar, that doesn't mean my solar roof stops working. It's still perfectly fine, and and the things that's in place is going to be perfectly fine. So you hopefully that would mean to reduce some of the sort of the this you know highly tensed uh, system that we have at the moment. I'm not, you know, but I'm not sure how that spills over into global geopolitics because we'll I'm sure we'll find something else to argue about. But but hopefully. Uh, you know, take it down a couple of notches in terms of, of the, of the, you know, the, the sort of really um, having this really tense system for, for these key resources that we rely so heavily upon. And, and your academic circle, so in doing research and, and uh, especially in Sweden, is there a, a lot of discussion going on behind the scenes of something that that we we kind of need to know is going on or that kind of where the world's going i know johan rockstrom with planetary boundaries there's kate Rowworth with the donut economics and we're kind of all feeling that the current civilization models that we see around the world are not working for us anymore and we're starting to hear the emergence of the Green New Deal, planetary boundaries, donut economics. We're talking about regenerative economics, many different models. And, and the World Economic Forum has come out and said, you know, uh, we don't want to go back to normal, back to business as usual. This is the great reset. And um, some different models that are out there are being discussed. What are you seeing from your research, from your discussion, from those other PhDs, those other doctors who are doing the research who are trying to kind of not predict the future but you know say how, how what are the models of the future and how do we get there what are you hearing what's your emerging direction you you see what's going in yeah well uh my experience over the last five or ten years is that um things have really been picking up speed and and i listened to the discussions you have with ingmar Renshog. Uh, around we don't have time and you know things are yeah. going too slow they are going too slow but my view is also that they're going a lot you know faster than they have done in the, if you compare it to 10 years ago or even 15 when you around the time of the Copenhagen climate change meeting was, was, was to a large extent a fiasco and you know the the, the you know sort of the discussion around climate change and the discussion around global sustainability has as you know, to me, I, I find it super rewarding to work in this space because it seems like finally things are happening. Finally, things are going faster than I thought. Uh, things that I would have thought about five years ago as science fiction are being deployed right now. So one thing that we've been working a lot about, a lot on is, is steel production from hydro, using hydrogen, which has been like, you know, the process has been known for a while, but uh, actually implementing it. And we started working on this project of four, three or four years ago. And even at that time, it's something. Like, ah, well, it's something going to be around in maybe 2040. And now they're going to build it in 2026 or 2024. So it's now it's now it's going to happen. Uh, 
and those are the kinds that you don't see. And if you just look at like the the, the international uh, global panel on, on climate change, when IPCC, when they do this uh, prognosis, you know they have no they go they go back maybe five or ten years, and they don't even have this prospect of having this kind of uh, hydrogen based steel making is sort of something that's going to be some way in the future, but it's now going to happen a lot sooner than anyone thought, uh, I think at least. And the same goes if you look at electric vehicles and electric trucks, which we, we've also done research on, that seems also perfectly viable. So just we, we're, I think we're in a stage now where a lot of the action on the ground is moving faster than research, moving faster than policy, policy, um, policy processes, you know. Um, for example, you know, look at electrification of, of transport. Five years ago, we had the start of uh, investigative process in Sweden around this, uh, and you have right. You start with your sort of priors in terms of you know what the costs are from different technologies, so on. And then uh, five years later, the I don't know the cost of batteries have maybe gone down fifty percent or something like that, and that completely shifts the way the cal the calculation works out. And you have to sort of so oh, now we took decisions based on what's happened five years ago. All right. Uh, what happened here so i think that to me is a really positive sign that things are moving faster than i thought because because that seems to me that we're going in the right direction obviously you know there's going to be things that move fast in the wrong direction as well i'm very conflicted about uh, bitcoin mining and stuff like that so which might be seen as a sort of another i don't know an evil twin of of, of, the, of the of the developments in, in solar and batteries and so on yeah, there, I mean, there. I, I believe there's always two sides to to the coin, two sides to everything. There's there's that balance, and the the thing that I also see, and I have to agree with you, is that this uh, exponential function. So I, I've been doing this for a long time too, and I'm just like, boy, this is not seeing any change. And today's Earth Day, uh, although the the show will air much later than Earth Day, um, well, I think we'll launching it sometime in June. Um, but I was watching the old Earth Day videos, the very first Earth Day summit and outdoor, uh, they were outdoor in a park and everybody was kind of listening to the talks. And some of the things that they were saying back then are some of the same things that we've heard Greta Thunberg and, and Ingmar Renholz from We Don't Have Time talking about and Fridays for Future and um, shouting and and being very active and, and saying what, how serious this situation is. And, and to look at that, you say, wow, not a lot of change, but I've also seen this exponential growth. And a matter of fact, um, Johan Rockstrom and Christiana Figueres and Patricia Espinosa also started this exponential roadmap to reach the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. And I really love how, you know, you, uh, in the beginning, you were saying, you know, for energy and, and what your uh, papers were on were really uh, SDG seven, uh, affor affordable and clean energy, and that we really move in, in this different direction that the sustainable development goals are our first ever global moonshot. They're our first roadmap and plan of action that we've had for a long time that are giving us a brand new operating system, a new civilization framework for all humanity. And if we can start implementing it, uh, and those who have started to implement it in their business models, in their lives, and, and say, let's even do one or two goals, they've come all out with this, this thing that we've touched upon several times, resilience. They've said, this is a better system. And it's fast. It has the components of the exponential function. We apply it and boy, it just is taking off. And I have definitely seen that exponential growth um, in many ways. Uh, during, I, 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 I have to be honest, during the Trump administration, I, I thought we we're going exponentially in the wrong direction. Um, but in some directions, it was a great wake up call for many. And now that um, today is also the Biden-Harris uh, Climate Day and, and Earth Day and many events. This You said you had another event today and I've had a few others as well that people are doubling down. They're making the commitments. Instead of talking, they're starting to put these plans into action. And um, I, I really love to see it. And, and that's why I, I thoroughly enjoyed, I, I read um, 
several of your papers, not all of the entire series of per perspective that you have, but uh, uh, at least six of them. Uh, four, uh, six, not all of them were in perspective, four in perspective, and then some were uh, featured stories that you had and the others were in the wash area that you do. And I just love what uh, SEI is doing, what you guys are bringing out and, and, and with these, because it gives me more insight and different perspectives and research and views on what's occurring and the bigger perspective of our environment and where we're going with energy transitions. What we hear is we need, you know, especially from Al Gore, uh, uh, we need this renewable energy transition and these big grids. And we hear what Elon Musk does in Solar City and these big projects. Uh, and kind of those little things that are happening in developing countries, like the IKEA example, and like some others get washed under the bridge. We don't understand how they fit into that converging intersection that you spoke about. And so I'm, gl I'm glad you're bringing those stories out and those perspectives. I, I need to ask you um, again, two, two things, I guess, you because you, you kind of didn't answer it. Do you feel that there is a human condition and that we will come uh, to a unification somehow, or there will always be that polar opposite, the kind of the quantum dilemma where there's always off and on at, 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 at all times, or do you, do you not see that in your areas of work? I think, I think we, I don't think we're going to sort of be a unified, globally unified, um, um nation where everyone agrees i think that's i think we're always going to be um um want to group ourselves into smaller um, cliques i think that's that's just natural because you can't sort of there's so much reward that comes from having people agree with you basically and uh you know people rob each other different ways you know so it's 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 difficult uh, to see how we're gonna get away from that. But if you get to the point where you have like um, intercity rivalry around whose soccer team is the best, if, you know that's that's fine. You know that's not gonna kill. You know maybe kill a few people if they're really uh, nasty fans. But it's not. It's gonna be. It's not like civilization threatening. So if you get to that point of sort of disagreement, I think that's that's something we'll, we can live with. But uh, obviously it's quite a long ways to go to, towards we get to that. But, uh, but uh, just to say one thing more about the exponential thing, I think it's important to see also that the, the sort of development that we've seen really positive in the energy sector and, uh, and a lot of developments that have been happening there is, is very promising, but it's not, and that's, that's been helping uh, been a, a really large help in terms of driving uh, climate change mitigation along the way. But, we're not. We don't. We shouldn't see that as that's something that's, that can be simply replicated in everything else. You mentioned washing, and I think it's going to be a completely different set of. I don't. Know, a completely different, but it's going to be a different way of of managing things. There, it's not going to be as easy, probably, uh, relatively speaking. Just because the sort of conditions and the, the how sanitation as a uh, as a sort of a societal services is, is completely different than energy you know, in many ways. So I think we, we really need to, yes, we need to learn from the examples and the developments that we've seen in, in, in solar and in wind and in, in batteries and some other technologies, but we shouldn't take those for granted. We really need to figure out, okay, why has this been very positive? What's been happening here? What are the conditions that made this work? And what can we take from these developments and apply to other sectors uh, and what, what doesn't apply basically how do we what what lessons can we learn and what what sort of uh, is doesn't really apply i think just taking that analytical mindset i think that's going to be super valuable for for solving the rest of our societal uh, sustainability problems well just for my listeners in case they don't know what wash is wash stands for water sanitation and hygiene um there's also some very specifically uh issues around women and girls, gender uh, as a major issue around disproportionately around wash services and, and those basic uh, needs of humanity. Um, 
I, I tend to be one who groups them with energy. So I, I believe that all basic needs, air, breathing, water, energy, uh, th those things are kind of the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that they're very closely tied one way or the other, just as I, just as I feel our biome, our biodiversity and our biome of our planet is closely tied to basic needs and the biome of the human body, our human gut, and how when we see those two out of alignment, then, then we start to see pandemics and other things emerge that create a ripple effect of problems. Um, it's, it's always kind of an, an easier point for us to be, Sweden's a beautiful place, you're academic, even though you work in, in other places around the world. I'm in Hamburg, Germany from the US, I also travel to developing countries, work a lot with Asia and Africa. But uh, we, we come from what Kate Raworth would say, this weird societies, Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. So weird uh, acronym kind of societies. And, and here is also the place where most of the economic research is conducted, thereby also producing a biased response and specifically biased and disproportionate for those in developing countries, like we think we know how we can solve their problems. Um, the one thing that I do know is historically, it's been shown that basic needs, especially around food, is something of how we can control uh, and manipulate other people around the world, whether it's colonialism or whatever else, whether it's Native Americans who uh, their food supplies were cut off. And so it's, it's an issue that's not only tied to the sustainable development goals, but it's one that we need to understand and grasp in order to get us into a new epoch, a new epoch of, of sustainability, or whether it's like Jim, Jim Lovelock said, you know, this Nova scene, this hyper intelligent <laughs> new future that we need to go in for humanity. Uh, I, I like to call it the regenerative economy. Um, people a lot of the time don't understand or don't, uh, when I talk about sustainability, why I talk about one, economies, two, innovations, and three, the future. And that those are really pillars that all tie to sustainability. They're all, uh, you have to have a good grasp of economics and not only the bad economic models of extractive economies and, and capitalism, but ecological economics. Um, one innovation, sustainable innovations that catapult us like renewable energy, battery, solar panels, whatever else that can have the, the opportunity to catapult us into the future. And then, then why would you say, Mark, you're a sustainable futurist or a resilient futurist? And I'll tell you why. It's because you really need to have a good grasp of what a sustainable future is or what generational uh, sustainability looks like one well into a few decades into the future, if not more uh, centuries um, to, in order to reach that. And that leads me to my hardest question that I have for you today. Uh, and it's really the burning question, WTF. It's not the swear word, although maybe you've said it during this pandemic time, but it's, what's the futures? What's the plan? What's, where are we going? Where's humanity? What's the path? And uh, if you don't know for yourself or for uh, the organization uh, SEI, where do you think it should be? And what should we be doing to get there? Yeah. You know, Again, you know, from my point of view, getting rid of fossil energy, I think that's a good start. I think uh, we can work it from there. <laughs> that that in itself was a huge, probably one of the largest um, techno technological transformations in human history, and it's going to happen in, in a very, very short time, uh, you know, speaking in terms of historical perspectives. Um, we are not going to, that's not going to solve everything. You know, um, people are going to, suffer even in a in a climate change um, you know a zero emission world there's going to be shitty things happening but um it's it's a 
it's a philosophical question. So what's the point of humanity? You know, <laughs> so I think I think we should really try to avoid extinction. I think that's a good 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 first first start. Um, but then you know, there's so many things that will that will. Um, uh, interestingly, when you talk about climate change, you talk about sort of you, you throw years like 2050 and 2070. You throw around those like it's like it's you know comfortable knowing what was going to happen at that point. But there's going to be so many things changing that has nothing to do with, or that have, may have things may have to do with with uh, climate change and, and environment that we don't even you know we cannot even fathom what they're going to look like at this moment in terms of technological development, but also political development and so on. So just throw in a pandemic and I say, oh, wow, I hadn't really had that in my, that wasn't in my projection for the coming five years. And, and how, look how that, uh, you know, twists things around. So I think, um, yeah, but just, you know, get rid of those fossil fuels. I think that's a good start. <laughs> do, you, do you have another, what's the futures for you and your family? I try to live um, in the now <laughs> as much as I can, but still doing things that in the right direction. I don't think that much forward. Um, I, 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 I have an awesome life. I'm so, uh, I'm very happy and I get to do the things I do. And what sort of drives me is just learning stuff. The, the th I think that's a good, good thing to have as a researcher that you, that you really love being wrong and prove and um, sort of realizing that oh my god so the best things in my work is when i have like these uh, moments like oh, my god this changes everything i haven't understood anything about the world until this specific moment and i have lots of those and i think that's that's awesome it's feel like you're sort of being reborn every time that happens it's like oh my now after this realization i see the world in a completely different way and that's is so rewarding that I can, if I can just continue having a couple of those um, month, that's you know that's and that's I can I can live with that. So, uh, in, in some respects, the reason I I ask uh, the question, what's the future, is uh, I want to know if there's a roadmap, a plan um, that that we're moving towards a direction. You, you know, you, the old adage, uh, if we don't have a plan or a map or don't know where we're going, we're sure as heck not going to get there because we'll just be kind of taking uh, wherever the wind blows us. Um, but the question is really, do you believe that there is a plan, a, a earth shot, a moon shot, a climate shot or something out there that will, will that get us to 2030, 2050, those numbers that those years that uh, you you were just mentioning, or do you think, uh, yeah, there could be a roadmap, but, but it might be disrupted by more pandemics or more um, future that just, we just can't even tell. I think it's good, you know, isn't this, there's this old saying that no war plan survives the first day of battle, something like that. So I think it's good to have a, a set up a plan because it, it forces you to do to think things through. But then you shouldn't sort of you should also sort of you know have it as a as a general direction. But then be prepared to change things as you know the circumstances change. I think that's the key way of working things. And we we've done a lot of work on scenarios and and it's it's really valuable to to do these kinds of exercises. But you shouldn't see them as as forecasts or, or see them as um, um, strategies in themselves, but just see them as, as tools that force you to, to uh, imagine different uh, things that could happen. And then sort of, you, you know, when, when things happen rapidly, you have to work you know, with your gut feeling pretty much as well. And I think that should, that, that's something that shouldn't be, shouldn't be underestimated. We, we could go do, down a whole different rabbit hole. One of my events and talks today was uh, about the microbiome and our gut health and, and how the people are saying that's our second brain. So, you know, there is, there's a lot of, uh, of that, you know, that guiding us around in certain ways um, to, to make those gut in instincts. Um, I have three more questions for you, but they're all for my guests. They're kind of a sustainable takeaways for them. 
But before we go into those, I just want to ask you, is there anything you want to tell us about perspectives or about Stockholm Environment Institute uh, that basically we need to know that we need to be thinking about that is coming up new that you're working on um, what your hopes and ambitions are for us all as readers and listeners. Um, some things change really fast. Um, some things uh, change really slowly. And it's um, uh, not really clear um, which is which and where to how to classify things. So just don't sort of, um, just because nothing happens for a long time doesn't mean that that's the sort of the, 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 the end of it all or the sort of the way things have to be because suddenly, you know, things can happen really, really rapidly. And I think that's, that's promising, but also scary. Definitely. If there was one message you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change your life, what would it be your message? Do you mean in terms of, uh, of, of, of um, from a global perspective or, or from a... From a it's totally open to you. It's basically a message that has the power to change my listeners' life. A kind of your message, something that yeah maybe you only get from you. Yeah, I think, I think this thing of learning to love being wrong and learning to uh, love seeing things, having your, your world you reconfigured often. I think that is because that that's going to happen anyway. <laughs> so you better it's it's you'll, you'll have a happier life if you if you if you sort of uh, incorporate that into your your personal. I have a lot of uh, PhDs, a lot of researchers listen to the podcast. Um, a lot of people who are interning with the UN or trying to just get their feet wet at some university here or there in in many areas but what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact and, and leave a positive mark on this world i think you shouldn't be afraid to dig deep um, but at the same time it's it's super important to um, you know geek out for sure but also try to see the the big picture have the big picture in mind but then choose something to geek out in because I think that that's super valuable um, to have a, that that combination where you have a broad perspective, you understand how the world works, but you have something that you're really good at uh, that you can bring in terms of, of uh, contributions. I love that. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the beginning, from the start? Um, things usually work out. Um, and there's very few things in my line of work that, that um, destroys people's lives. Um, even if it feels like that, when you sort of mess things up, it's, it's very rarely that you kill someone. <laughs> you know, I, I just compared my wife's uh, medical doctor and you, uh, you know, she, she has a, a different situation there, you know? So I, I consider that uh, just to have that perspective uh, and just try to see things well. Yes, I, I think my work is important and interesting, but I don't see it as you know, um, it's nothing like uh, super special about it. You know, and, and also have this perspective. You know, for uh, a very good example, in uh, in my kid, my my uh, one of my sons is learning to to bicycle, and this in 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 I think August he was practicing in the backyard and then he sort of rides his bike right into the road that uh, just is outside our house. And uh, so he doesn't break. And then the first there's a car that comes and just inks, just like uh, 40 centimeters from his legs. And then there's a bus coming from the other direction, breaks like 30 centimeters from his, his leg. And since then, every day, I think of almost every day, okay, this is another day where my kid isn't dead. So from that perspective, you know, most days are pretty good. So if I feel like, if I feel sorry for myself, I can sort of bring out that thing. Oh yeah, well, you know, he's not dead. So that's, a, that's, a, that's something that's better than, than it could have been. So uh, I think that's just to have those kind of um, 
perspectives that sort of realize makes you realize what what's what's important in, in life. Well, I, I really appreciate you letting us inside of your ideas and sharing your perspectives with us. And um, uh, there are some great words of wisdom and learning lessons in there. And and we will post all your links to perspectives and to the Stockholm uh, Environment Institute on our website and in the show notes of, of this recording. And I really appreciate you being here and taking the time to talk to me. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Ola. Good talking to you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.